Good morning, guys. We have another episode of Coffee with Coach Patrick, and today I'm joined by um, two-time defending world champion, uh, Olympic bronze medalist, uh, former world record holder, and Canadian senior national team member, Kylie Moss. Good morning, Kylie. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. Thanks. How are you? I'm excellent. Um, it's actually kind of nice for me to be able to say this, but it's nice to finally meet you. I know we haven't really officially <laughs> met in person. Yes, it is. I've definitely seen you around, but I've never officially met you. I think it was, um, I'm trying to remember the meet, but I know we've been nearby our teams at times. I know I've congratulated you after a couple of races at trials and things like that, but that's the, the extent of how much we've spoken. Um, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, I know you like when you go to the big meets and we're at trials or you go to major meets, you spend a lot of your time in the pit area, right? And you don't really mm -hmm. watch a lot of the swimming. So I know I've come back from a lot of meets and people have asked me, they said, well, you know, how's, how does so-and-so look when they swim or how does so-and-so look when they swim? I said, to be honest, I don't really watch a lot of the swimming if it's not my athletes. However, in your case, because I've coached so many male backstrokers over the last eight years, you're always racing right before my guys race. And I don't, I didn't have anyone in the field. So it was, I got to watch you race a lot, um, over the course <laughs> of the last six years. So I feel like I've watched a lot of your swimming. Um, <laughs> so, uh, first thing I wanted to ask you is, how are you doing? How is your family doing? Uh, you're in Toronto, I'm assuming. So it, hopefully everyone's okay. Just how is everybody doing in your world? And how are you holding up with this whole kind of lockdown uh, process? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually in Windsor with my parents at my uh, family home that I grew up in. So I was in Toronto for, I think, maybe a week or two weeks after the pools had closed. And then um, my sister is also lives in the city. So, uh, my parents had come up to bring her home because her work and everything was closed. So she was going to come home. And I decided last minute I should, um, hop in the car and come home for a bit because at that point that was before trials had been postponed, but, um, the Olympic games hadn't been postponed yet. So we were kind of just in limbo with, um, no facilities or anything. So I thought, well, I might as well take this opportunity to come home while I can. I don't often get the chance to come home and spend time with my family. So um, I wasn't planning on being here for this long, but um, here I am. And uh, yeah, my family's great. Um, everyone is, is healthy and well, which is all I can ask for right now. And um, just trying to, to stay positive and, and enjoy the time with my family. That's fantastic. Uh, I know that's always the big concern is making sure that all of our family and our friends and our loved ones are healthy and safe. So that's really, really good to hear. So being back home in Windsor, so is it you, your mom and dad and your sister, the four of you guys are all, all back home? Yes. Yeah. My brother, I have an older brother as well and he, okay. he doesn't live at home anymore, but he's still in the city of Windsor. So I've seen him a couple of times from, from afar. Well, that's nice at least to have all your family nearby, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe not the greatest after eight weeks of lockdown, but <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're we're definitely getting on each other's nerves someday. But um, we ha like I haven't been at home for this long since I moved from home six years ago. So um, we all haven't been under one roof in a long time. So it's been kind of nice to catch up and and just enjoy the time together. That's nice. Um, so being at home, what's your setup right now? How are you able to train? Like, can you can you run me through some of the things you're able to do just to stay fit, stay active as much as possible? Yeah, um, I can definitely say it's been challenging at times, and I think everyone's probably experiencing that to some extent. And um, luckily, we have through like my program back at school in Toronto, we have our strength and conditioning coach running three sessions online per week. So I have those, which is really nice to connect with, obviously him and have some structure, and then the rest of my teammates as well. Um, so I do that, and. Um, have had some access to a spin bike from a local gym that um, I borrowed it from. And so I have that. And when it's nice weather outside, I go for bikes and go for walks and um, different home workouts and trying to get into a bit of yoga. And I'm really mixing it up, um, trying to keep a structured program as best as I can, but also have been enjoying doing different activities and trying to work on other things. So one of the things that I think about all the time, um, I don't know if you've seen, there was this Connor McDavid um, documentary that came out recently. It was like, whatever it takes. And it kind of illustrated what he did when he, he buggered up his knee pretty good at the end of last season, what he went through in a rehab and deciding surgery and all that. And one of the key things that I love from it is how many different sports he tapped into because he couldn't skate or be on the ice. And then one of the things him and his trainer talked about was that he's like, now we have an opportunity to address little areas or different things of, of, maybe my weaknesses that I couldn't address before. Is there anything that you're able to kind of focus in on, whether it be physical, mental, anything like that in this time frame where you can't swim all the time, so your schedule's disrupted and you have time to maybe address little things that you, you've been wanting to, but haven't got to yet? Yeah, for sure. 
Uh, definitely at the beginning, I would say I was in the same boat. I was like so excited to be doing different activities and it was kind of nice to have a bit of a break from the pool and just to try different things because often like my coaches are very much like you need to live in a bubble and you know, I'm, I'm a bit clumsy, I have to say. So they're always very um, worried, I think when I try and do different things, but um, I was really excited to just try different things. Like, I don't know in biking even like I we, we don't do that at school so um just to try different activities and to do different um dry land workouts but um yeah I have been working on something like yoga or um just even stretching and and foam rolling and recovery is something so important to swimming but it's something that I find myself um not forgetting but it's you can easily just kind of push it aside when things are busy and you're tired and you know after practice after making dinner and everything it's nine o'clock you just want to go to bed and um that's something I can definitely improve on so um yeah getting into yoga a little bit I've been trying to do a little bit of mindfulness meditation kind of um again that's something that I you know I know I need to work on and I know that it takes a lot of time to practice and really get good at that but it's something that I can easily you know push aside when we're in tough training and we're traveling and and things are busy so um yeah I would say those are the the number of things that I've been trying to work on um not perfect but trying to do them every day and um yeah just try and better myself and in any way possible right now nice well you made me think of a couple of things with what you're saying so the, the one thing I was curious about is have you been able to uh maybe pull a family member or two into a workout or get them to, to maybe do a little bit of activity, some yoga or something with you? Yeah, actually, I have a couple times. Um, my sister has done a couple things with me, and um, my mom has actually gotten in. It's really cool, I think, to see uh, the different fitness industries and accounts and things like that all online now. And um, I think for someone who maybe didn't have a gym membership or, you know, didn't really know where to start, didn't know what they're interested in. Like there's so many different things you can do for exercise and activities. And to now have access to that all at home online, you can do it anywhere, anytime. I think that's so cool. So um, I've seen my mom get into doing some different exercises, doing like a bar class. Um, I've also tried doing a couple of those as well. So um, I think in, in a sense, this whole pandemic has been really cool in that in that aspect of connecting people and allowing people to um you know try different things and have these different opportunities that they wouldn't maybe normally get into it's funny you mentioned that like i i feel guilty at times when i say this but at times with the pandemic you feel like there's these little silver linings to everything right Mm -hmm. like i mentioned i have a i have a 14 month old daughter and not going to staging camp and trials was really a bummer and, and we were ready but at the same time I had three and a half weeks with my little girl and I've got to experience some really cool stuff and um, reconnecting with family members or things that you haven't had a time to do. And I imagine with you, that's got to be one of the biggest challenges because you run a crazy schedule, you know, being going through school, going through swimming, going through traveling around the world, like just having a moment to reconnect with people and and see what's available to you online and and starting to see what you need or or don't need so much. um, That's probably been a big eye opener for, for you as it has for everyone else. Oh yeah, hugely. I think the the most important thing and the thing that I see, um, you know, the most is just having this opportunity with my family. And, um, you know, like I've said, I, at most I have maybe a week or two weeks at home at the end of a, a big season at the end of an international competition. And usually at that time, you know, I love coming home and, and by the end of the season I'm trained and I'm looking forward to just laying on the couch and having homemade food for my mom and, um, you know, seeing a couple of friends here and there, but um, it's different being home in this sense where, you know, I want to be able to like see people that I never get to, to see and um, do things, but unfortunately we can't, but yeah, just taking, um, being grateful for just being home and spending the time with my family. And like you said, just catching up, you know, if I go for a walk, sometimes I'll just call up someone that I don't talk to as much as I want to just because life gets busy and um yeah, I've, I've, I've found those silver linings and I think that's really important for everyone to do. And I keep telling myself, um, to put things in perspective and, you know, swimming is our world and, um, you know, we spend so much time on the pool deck, but everyone in the entire world is having to make sacrifices in their own way, you know, whether they, they out of a job now or their job, you know, 
they're working from home, like everyone is dealing with this and having to adjust to it. And um, I like to just keep in mind that I am grateful to just be where I am and like have access to go outside when I want to go for a walk. You know, some countries at at points in this pandemic weren't allowed to do that. So um, even just being grateful for those little things, I think is important to, to continue to remind yourself. Absolutely. And I bet your mom was, was pretty happy to have her girls home on mother's day. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you because you're doing this home training and different types of training, um, what other sports and what's your athletic background? Like I like to go through and talk about, you know, swimmers and their journeys, their stories, when got them into swimming in the first place, um, and all that good mm -hmm. stuff. But I'm curious, like what's your athletic background as far as other sports go? And has that been helpful in any way to doing some at home training? Yeah. Um, so I actually, growing up, I played competitive soccer for like maybe six or eight years. Like I played it from a young age um, in my town. We, we had like, we were the 1996 girls team. So I was a part of that for, I want to say like eight years. And I also played hockey just recreationally um, house league at um, just locally. And I, I did those when, I started, I was doing those while I was swimming as well. And then when, I think I was maybe 12 when I decided to just stick with swimming, mm -hmm. I started swimming competitively when I was 10. So I was doing, I was juggling kind of the three of them and I played um, sports in grade school and I did a little bit of track and field and cross country in high school. But um, I would say after the age of, you know, after grade nine, I was pretty much fully doing only swimming and even in grade nine I was um I was only really doing cross country in the fall mm -hmm. um but yeah I, I do I I loved being active as a kid and I think just as a family we were very much outside people and just playing outdoors whether it was shooting basketball with my brother or we would play tennis on the street like we we just loved being active and I loved all sports and was always interested in sports so um as I got older and I was focusing only on swimming. I I definitely think the sports that I played growing up helped because you just develop a foundation for agility and skills. And I think those can transfer to any sport you choose. Um, I like to think so. Um, but yeah, I, 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 once I focused on swimming, I definitely think I lost some of my, um, coordination or balance or you know little things like that that maybe I was better at when I was younger but I feel like that also just happens as you get older and you know I've obviously spent a lot of time doing one sport so um, trying something new is always going to be challenging at the beginning. Well and it's interesting and I always find like doing multiple sports or different things when you're young really develops your athleticism or just your physical literacy right knowing how your body works and one of the things I find interesting is that you did a nice blend of team sports with the soccer and some hockey, but then you also did cross country or that sort of thing and swimming, which are individual sports. So it kind of gives you that, that more well-rounded athleticism and, and even the idea of working with the team or working individually, working with different coaches. Um, I think mm -hmm. all that goes into developing who you're going to be, right? So I'm For curious, sure. when doing those sports, so soccer, I guess, was your first sport that you kind of got into when you mm -hmm. were young. So... Mm -hmm. at, what was your swimming background before joining the club? Like, what got you, like, did you do the lessons thing? Did you do a summer league? Like, what got you into it? And was there a person or something that said, okay, you know what? I'm going to try this competitive swim, swimming thing, and I'm going to, you know, try a season and see how, see how it goes or see how I like it. Yeah. Uh, so I started, I started swimming lessons. I don't know what age we were, but um, my mom and dad had put me and my siblings in, in swimming lessons because my mom grew up at a cottage and, um, you know, my dad didn't know how to swim for the longest time. And my mom, you know, wanted us all to learn how to swim just for safety reasons. So we started out at a young age and went through lessons. And then we were a part of our, like a summer swim team locally, which was called the LaSalle Lizards. And we did that for, that was just summer swim. And, um, that, I don't know what age we would have done that for, but, um, we did that for a number of summers. And then eventually I decided I just liked swimming. I loved being in the water. I loved, um, you know, wasn't necessarily swimming at that point, but kind of just splashing around even. And um, I decided I wanted to join 
to do it more throughout the year as well. And the only opportunity to do that was to join a club. Mm-hmm. So I um, joined the local club, which was Windsor Essex Swim Team. And that was at age 10 when I joined them. So then you got into that, um, like most kids got in and did you know right away, like, Hey, this swimming thing or being in the water is something that I really love. Or was it like, no, I'm just trying this and we'll see where it goes. Like, you know, different people have different feelings. Like for you, was it something that you drew you to it right away or was it something that grew over time? Uh, definitely grew over time. I, I mean, I loved it when I started it and I thought, um, you know, I really, it was, it was nice because it was almost like a social thing for me as well. And, and that's something I tell a lot of younger clubs or kids is that like, I really loved swimming and I think I stuck with swimming because of the environment that I was in and the group of people. And, um, you know, there were so many of us that were all the same age and we didn't necessarily even go to the same school. I don't think any of us went to the same school, but we, um, you know, so coming to practice was fun. We would talk about, you know, our day school, whatever. And it was just, it was almost a social thing as well as much as swimming. So, um, I, but again, I wasn't doing that as the only thing that was, was going on in my life. And I think that's also important. And that's what, you know, kept me in the sport was that it wasn't all I was focused on at such a young age. It was just kind of something I did and, you know, something I, I did like doing, but, um, it wasn't everything. And, um, yeah, I, I just, we grew up together with those group of people and I, and I really enjoyed that. And, um, I would definitely say my love for the sport and, and I got, as I, you know, I started to see improvements, just small improvements. I, um, you know, I had different goals and, um, yeah, I would say just over time, it it definitely evolved to, um, become my sport. And, um, eventually it did get to the point where I obviously got to grade 12 and I realized, you know, this is something I want to do, continue to do. And, um, that was when I began looking for universities that, um, I could attend that had a swim team and move from there. Nice. So I, and that's one of the things I find fascinating. So you started at age 10 and then you were in it for a few years where you were competing at, you know, regional championships and things like that, having fun with your friends, doing other sports. Um, then I think it was like 2009 and I might get some of the details wrong. I apologize. I'm just going from memory here, but I think it was 2009 where you, you kind of got to your first provincial level meets, but at that time you weren't even racing backstroke, right? You were racing more yeah, fly no. and, and IMs and stuff like that. Um, and then the next year, uh, you kind of got to your first Canadian age group nationals at age 14. And, and once again, but, but when you started, when did you start to realize or your coach started to realize and talk to you and say, like, hey, like, you know what, you're, you're getting pretty good at this. Or and when did you start to kind of get that sense like, hey, maybe, maybe I'm pretty good at this. I'm getting to the higher levels. I made provincials and all that um, around 13, 14. But was it then or was it a little further down the line when you started to do a bit better? Uh, further down the line, for sure. I would say, um, you know, I don't really remember all the details of when I when I started racing at provincials and age groups and and that but um I would say I was like with my group and you know we were all kind of at that provincial level and then we moved up in groups at the club and we were all kind of at that that age group level and then um I definitely wouldn't say that I considered myself good until even like once I got to university and I you know I knew when I was looking for schools um in grade 11 and 12 end of grade 11 beginning of grade 12 that I didn't really know what to expect and I didn't really know, you know, how I chalked up to other people in the States, in Canada. And, um, you know, I knew I wasn't like a super good swimmer because I, you know, I never made any sort of, I had made a couple of, of provincial teams, um, but I hadn't, yeah, like I, I had never made any sort of junior team for Canada. Um yeah, I, I would, I'd say late, definitely later on, I, I realized it wasn't until probably grade, um, you know, end of grade 12 or, you know, even university that I, I realized um, my swimming abilities. Um, but yeah, when you were touching on the strokes, I didn't compete back. Well, I did compete backstroke, but it wasn't my stroke. I would, I competed a lot more fly and um, fly and, or fly and um, I am. I think free too, but that was something that I really, I think 
you know, I thank my coaches for my club coaches for is just developing um, a swimmer who had a foundation in all strokes and all techniques. And I think that has really helped me because, um, you know, just that feel for the water and that technical side, I think really stemmed from having such a great foundation in club swimming and working on technique, working on drills and just racing all the events and all the strokes. I, I find that interesting. And I got a couple of things I'm curious about. So one is, um, so I was in Ontario up until I think I moved out to Vancouver in the fall of 2010. So I was coaching in, in Ontario in the GTA and stuff. So um, I was around that time and your birth year, and it, there was a lot of phenomenal young women that were coming up in the sport. So Ontario was so deep on the women's side that mm-hmm. um, you're up against some stiff competition. A lot of those girls that were maybe breaking provincial records or national age, national records are going on those junior teams. You weren't kind of getting on those teams. Um, I guess the question I have is because I hear this out of a lot of young swimmers is that, well, I don't even know if I'm that good or I don't know if a, t- a school like U of T, a top program is going to want me. Did you go through any of those emotions when you were coming through age group swimming and coming through club swimming? And then when it got to the university, like who's going to really want me? Am I good enough to go here? Did you have those feelings? For sure. Um, I think, you know, I think it's natural to have those feelings. And I think, um, you know, regardless of how you feel, I think you should um, still approach those programs and still, um, you know, send those emails or, you know, things that whatever make the phone call that you need to make in order to um, reach out to that coach. But because I really don't think it matters. I mean, it matters, but a lot of things can change and a lot of, you know, you can develop so much as, as an athlete and um, you never know what a program needs or what a program is looking for. So to never close any doors. And I'm really grateful that, you know, my parents were the ones that were kind of pushing me towards that. Like I, in grade 11 and 12, yeah, I did. I knew I wanted to swim in university, and I knew I wanted to attend a, a good academic school. So those were kind of my my guidelines. But um, I was because I live so close to the states. I was heavily influenced to go to the states, and a lot of the swimmers in my club team had um, gone to the states before me. So it was all I kind of knew from their experiences and from um, you know what they had gone through and what they told me and. Um, you know, my parents were the ones that kept me, you know, to keep Canada as an option. And, um, you know, ultimately I ended up here. So really I would say just, you know, never close any doors and, um, yeah, just to keep all your options open and you never know, you know, how much you're going to improve in in a certain amount of time or what a program is looking for. So, um, to always keep your options open and explore everything that you can. Definitely. Um, so on the, the note of universities and choosing where you went, you went and I, if I, you, you studied kinesiology at U of T, correct? Yeah. So, yeah. so when you went through the process and, and when did it start? Some kids, like they start early grade nine and 10, a lot of them, it's grade 11 is your primary year where you're really focusing so you can do recruiting trips for you. What was the process like? I guess it's a multifaceted question. Like what was the university kind of pursuit or, or looking into to where you're going to go? What was the process like for you? Was there a lot of schools in Canada and the U.S. you were looking at? And, and who were the pivotal people in helping support you in making that decision and, and ultimately led you to yeah. choosing U of T? Yeah, and I'll just make one point that I just remembered from, from the, your previous question was that I, I developed as uh, like a woman a lot later than a lot of, of my other friends in, in swimming and in club swimming. And I grew a lot later than a lot of my friends. And I found that really challenging to see especially when I was a bit younger was to see all my friends succeed and you know they were getting taller and I was like still so tiny and small and um, I think that was something that I had to come to terms with was that everyone is different and everyone is going to grow at different stages and um, I just happened to be later than a lot of my friends so um, that just kind of goes off of you know you never know um, you know what's going to happen and to really just continue to stay positive and have confidence in yourself and to work hard. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll eventually get there, but on to your, your current question. Um, I, so I found the process extremely overwhelming and very, um, challenging. I am very undec- indecisive person in, in the first place. And so having even to look on that large of a scale was, was really traumatizing and, um, you know, there's, were, there were dinners. I remember in, in high school and I would have dinner after practice and my dad would ask me one question about 
no, well, like, what do you want to study even? Like, what are you interested in? And I would just break down in tears. Like, I had no, like, I didn't want to talk about anything. I didn't know, you know, I just found the whole process extremely overwhelming. And um, partly because I didn't really know what I wanted, partly because I didn't, you know, it is an overwhelming process. And when schools are calling you and coaches and you're having to have conversations with coaches that you've never met before and never, you know, you don't, it's intimidating. And um, it was, yeah, I found it, it, it had a crazy process. And I, the one thing I would say is to really just take your time and um, to not feel pressured by anyone or anything. And to really just think about where you can see yourself and where you, um, you know, maybe where you want to be, what makes you happy. You know, I think going on recruiting trips um, was important just to see the school and see if you can picture yourself there. And um, so I actually went on, I went on four, um, yeah, four American recruit trips. And then I went to two Canadian schools. So um, at the beginning, kind of looking at all the American schools, because there's so many. And because I'm so close to the States, um, you know, where I grew up, it was, as I said, I was kind of heavily influenced to go there. So I was looking at a lot of different schools just because um, we were so close, but um, eventually narrowed it down to four to take um, actual recruiter trips to. And then, um, yeah, as I said, my parents were the ones that said, you know, you should really keep Canada as an option. You never know. You never know what can happen. You never know what you're going to want to do. You never know, you know, you never know. So um, I, I took that, I took that from them and I'm obviously grateful that they, they pushed me to keep the Canadian doors open because eventually I did uh, decide U of T and Byron and Linda after going on a trip there, I, I just realized that it was, you know, I knew it was going to be a great school academically, which is what something that I wanted. And then um, I was, after having discussed with them, you know, I was going to miss a team and um, I visited there and the team was, was nice and very, very welcoming. And um, it wasn't too far from home for me and it wasn't too close. So it was kind of the perfect um, fit. And yeah, I haven't looked back since. No, and it, it certainly has all worked out well for you. Um, yeah. It's funny you mentioned like just kind of knowing the feel and things like that. And I, I've got two uh, swimmers, two young ladies that are going to U of T in the fall. And they went and they recruited and they did they did the trips and they went to a bunch of universities. But they, they came back and one of the things they said about Byron and Lynn is that it just felt right and the team felt right. And it's like, well, when you go and you'll know, you just trust your heart. And, and at the end of it, mm -hmm. you're going to know if it feels right or it doesn't, right? Um, so I'm exactly. curious. I, I'm not sure if... Uh, it's up to you. I don't know if you want to share or not, but can you let me like, what were the U S schools you were looking at that you went and visited and what was the other Canadian school just to get a, a bit of context? Yeah. So I, um, so I visited Louisville, um, Indiana, Minnesota, and Ohio state. Those are the four schools that I visited on American recruit trips and then Toronto and UBC I visited in Canada. So, yeah. So with the American schools, at least the four of them are relatively close to home, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, a number of them at the time had Canadian swimmers already there, which was something that I kind of saw comfort in. And I, you know, even just looking at, you know, obviously I'm, I'm Canadian and I wanted to compete at Canadian nationals and I wanted to compete at Canadian trials. And um, so those were obviously my goals. And I thought, you know, I found it comforting knowing that there was another Canadian at that school. And so they would be familiar with the Canadian system, the Canadian program. And, you know, even with NCAAs falling so close around trials, like I wanted to still be able to attend trials. And um, so things like that were on my mind. And I, I saw comfort in, in seeing someone else who had either had already been there or was there currently um, because I, I, I knew that hopefully the coaches would know the Canadian system a bit more than maybe a team that didn't have any Canadians and, and didn't know the, the kind of Canadian swimming schedule. So um, for people that are looking in the States, I would definitely recommend, you know, talking to the coaches and, and sharing your, your goals as wanting to compete at certain Canadian meets, because sometimes those may overlap with, um, you know, a meet that they have in mind or have already planned. I think if that's something you want to choose, pursue in Canada and, and continue to go through to trials and nationals and things like that. Like that's something you should look at. So 
Um, yeah, I, I saw comfort in, in seeing uh, those schools that had Canadians at, at them. Um, so I, I kind of have one more thing I want to touch on uh, in your age group or club career before we kind of dip into the U of T stuff. But um, so like you said, you, you didn't make any junior teams, but you did get a chance, if I'm not mistaken, to represent Ontario at the uh, Canada Games in 2013. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So in Sherbrooke? Yeah, um, that's correct. Yeah. And, and it's really fascinating when I look at that that Canada Games 2013 and how many swimmers from that team. And then I was also fortunate to be on Junior Pan 2014 and how many swimmers from those two kind of meets have gone on to be on senior mm -hmm. teams. So it was a lot of really good swimmers coming up together in the same generation. Um, what was that mm -hmm. experience like for you to go and be at a Canada Games and, and kind of experience that? Because at that time, that was the biggest thing you'd taken part in. Um, and what, did it kind of give you that, all right, multi-sport games, I, I want some more of this. This is, uh, this is, this is fun, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I remember it being such, as you had a large team and so many, you know, there were so many people from Ontario who I knew and who I had seen at provincials and, and age groups and things like that. And it was just so fun to be a part of and, um, to be at a multi-sport event. And, um, I don't even think I made it in backstroke at all. I'm pretty sure I made it in fly or That's free. Good. Yeah. Um, so, um, that's interesting, but, um, no, it definitely gave, gave a taste of, of what I wanted and, and furthered my goals and, and dreams to, to represent Canada. Yeah. It, it's crazy how much the Canada games has been like a launch pad for a lot of great athletes in our countries to come up and take that next step. It's been, been truly fantastic. Um, and you touched on something, which was the next thing I wanted to go with. I, I, when I look up kind of your results and things like that, the thing that I find so incredibly fascinating is that you had a lot of success swimming, like 50 free, 100 free, the 50 back, the 50 fly, the 100 fly, um, and then 200, 400 I am, but not a lot of 200 backs yeah. or 200 flies, which is it's yeah. so outside the box of what's normal for swimmers to swim the 400 I am, because you were, you were a, a darn good 400 I am, -er, right? Yeah. Um, so... Can you, can you walk me through just like the process of swimming those events, not doing a lot of the stroke 200s and then how it morphed? Because you came out of, you were a decent backstroker coming out of, of club, but you were a really good flyer, really good IMer. Uh, the sprint freestyle was really good. So then you made that transition and, and the backstroke just took off right on the first year. Um, so, so what was that evolution like in, in that you're swimming for IM, but not really swimming 200 flyer, 200 back? Yeah. Um, I don't really have an explanation for that. I have no idea how that happened. Um, I would say our club team, like when Jefferson team was very sprint oriented and, um, you know, we had a lot of, um, great sprinters, like provincially we, um, you know, our girls team, we, I, I just remember like it was, we were, it was like four by 50, I think free relays. Those were like our, our highlights. Um, so I, I, I don't really know how I ended up doing 200 and 400 IM, but I did continue doing IM until my third year at university, not the 400, but I, I stuck with the 200 for a while and I really love IM, but unfortunately I had a bit of an injury and, um, I have a little bit of a knee, knee injury. So I was told by doctors that I could either have surgery or never some breaststroke again. So um, had to weigh those options in, in the middle of the year, approaching Commonwealth Games and, and Pan Packs that summer. So I decided that breaststroke was never my stroke, and I, I never, never really saw any success in it. So I was, um, it was pretty easy for me to decide to not, you know, to give up breaststroke. But um, you know, unfortunately, that means to also give up I am. So it is something that I still wish I could, I could do because I think it really helps my training, even just like my backstroke training, I think it's important in training to have variety. And, um, you know, even I see myself now, like a, I'm obviously training a lot of backstroke, but I also do a decent amount of freestyle and fly. And I think that's, that's really good just to, you know, work all the muscles and work, um, just work your heart, work your lungs and everything in, in a different, in a different manner. Well, and it's nice to have that physical balance in training, right? Because, if you're just doing backstroke every single day, it, eventually your body kind of gets imbalanced and the wear and tear adds up, right? Um, exactly, yeah. The other thing that I, I really love about that is that there's no real explanation for not doing the 200s, and that was more of a, I just find that an interesting thing. But what I found great was that you came out as a, a sprint fly, sprint free, you swam the IMs, and it gave you the well-rounded base to become what you became, which is you know a world champion, Olympic medalist, and a world record holder in the, in the backstrokes. Um, 
so that was a really nice thing that was done with you in club swimming that you swam everything. And it's unfortunate with the knee because your 200 IM was banging pretty good. Um, so, so just to have that well-rounded development, um, cause when you got to U of T, I think you were like a one Oh, 300 backstroke long course coming in something like that. Right. Um, and then you swam through and you went to trials in 2015, but you, you came up short on making the, um, the, the world's team or, or the Pan Am team, but you did get on the FISU team. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you swam well at trials, but then you just kept getting better and better. And you dropped all the way to the point where you ended up going to FISU's and winning gold medal and, and becoming, you put up the fastest time in the country. I think that was when you broke a minute for the first time was in Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So can you walk me through coming in as a freshman, um, new school, new teammates, new coaches, you, you, you kind of still feel like you're more known for maybe some of the other disciplines and the backstrokes in there. And then at the end of the year, becoming, you know, and a gold medalist at FISUs and, and becoming the top hunter backstroker in the country. Yeah. Um, so leaving high school and going to university was obviously a huge adjustment. And um, I was really looking forward to it. And I was ready to kind of accept all the, all the challenges that I was going to face. And I, I actually had the opportunity to go to the Pan Am festivals in September of that first year with Charlotte, your summer, actually. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So that was, that was like a funky meet, you know, I never had, that was my first kind of senior um, national team. And I remember receiving my Canada gear in res, like I got my big box with a uh, Canada suit and Canada cap. And that, that was like always my dream. And so receiving that was, was like, I was so excited to go and um, to wear the maple leaf. And, um, but it was a weird meet. Like it was, it was a really bizarre setup. And I think, I don't even think it still runs because it was, it was kind of a one-off and, um, but we had a lot of fun and we, again, I'm pretty sure I raced like 200 fly, 400 IM there. Um, you know, I feel like I was all over the map in what I was racing, but, um, so that was kind of my first taste of, you know, swimming for Canada and then, um, going so that yeah that was almost beginning of September because I remember I had to start training in the middle of August which was bizarre because usually in club swimming we had that off and I was kind of just swimming by myself in order to be you know in better shape to to perform in September um, so that was so going to school then I had missed that beginning of school a little bit and then um yeah, I mean, coming back from that, I think it was an easy transition. You know, I obviously faced my challenges just being away from home and living in res and um, having school and adjusting to all that as anyone, um, you know, who goes off to university will have to face. But I really think that it was an easy transition. And I think Byron and Linda make it, made that happen. And, you know, they do make that happen for the majority of, of incoming freshmen because I think the way they approach, you know, just training and, and the way they, um, they're very understanding in the sense that they know you are, you're in a new city and you're going to school and you're, um, you know, living on your own or living with a roommate and um, you, you have exams and, you know, all the things you've never had before. And I think they, they make it so easy to be able to balance both. And, you know, they understand, you know, if you have an exam tomorrow morning, you might not come to, to tonight's um, workout. Or if you're really stressed, you have a paper, you know, Linda's, they're definitely going to tell you that you need to time manage and, and figure things out and not leave things to the last minute. But they're also going to understand that you have, you know, they want you to do well in school as well and, and to do well in other aspects of your life and to grow as a person. So um, they made that, I think that made my transition to university really easy because it wasn't. I wasn't super crazy about having to, you know, do everything properly and to be at every single practice and be my best at every single practice. And, um, and again, I also didn't know, have any real expectations of myself going into training. I just, you know, I showed up and I worked hard and I worked to the best that I could on that specific day and um, had fun with my teammates and, um, you know, left after practice was done. So um, I think they made that transition really easy and I think that is um you know a part of my success now is because I just um you know and they obviously still have that same approach and um a bit different for me now but 
um, you know, it, re it remains generally the same. Um, I forget your second part of your question. I kind of went off on a tangent. Um, no, I, lo I actually, I love uh, when people go off on tangents because like, I like hearing <laughs> that stuff. And I'm just going to, I'll bring up the question again, but I just want to jump on that. I just, I love hearing how, like an environment Linda have been doing in Toronto for quite some time. So I just love how they created a supportive environment. They understand what you're going through. They empathize with you. They know when to push. They know what to tell you. And it just seems like they manage their freshmen coming in to make that adjustment quite well. And, and I think that sometimes it gets forgotten in our sport how important it is for as coaches to set up an environment to allow people to come in, get comfortable, flourish, and then really excel as they go through. Um, and that kind of leads to what I was saying in, in the question was that it led through a really good season. Like you just kept getting better and better and better. And, and during that first year, the Hunter backstroke just took off um, and then kind of concluded with that gold medal and going under a minute for the first time. Um, so, so when did that transition happen? When did you have that conversation with either Linda or Byron and said like, Hey, you know what, this hundred backstroke starting to come along in a real nice way. Like, and I know you swam well at CIS and all that stuff at that point. So was there a point or a conversation where you guys had the talk saying, Hey, like, you know what, this, there's something here. Yeah. Um, so actually, yeah, my first year I remember at CIS, I raced fly and I was racing IM and, um, I think I was in the hundred back, but, um, that might've been the only one. And then I don't think we ever had a conversation, you know, saying, I don't even know at trials if I swam. I feel like I swam other events. I probably would have swam 100 fly, maybe 2 IM as well at trials. So I don't think I was going into trials only swimming the 100 backstroke. That wasn't my intention. And I don't think that was Byron and Linda's intention. And I don't really even know if they knew that my backstroke was going to, not, they probably did, but um, <laughs> know that my backstroke was going to, um be as, as well like you know if I would have because I think I yeah Byron loves to tell this story so I I swam prelims and I was going in first into final mm -hmm. and that was at trials and that was my first kind of like whoa I was I was shocked and I you know I was scared I didn't really know how to how to handle it all and um so he likes to share this story because he thinks that it really um, you know, help me in, in my future and help me at Sisu. And um, because in the final of that hundred back, so I was going in first, but then I finished third. And so he kind of, and that was, you know, when I missed the opportunity to be on the world team and the Pan Am's team in, which were in Toronto that year. So that would have been crazy. And, you know, that would have been awesome to be a part of, but he likes to share that story because he says that it really, you know, it just showed me, what I could do and, and gave me confidence. And, um, you know, fortunately that third place allowed me to be on the FISU team, which, um, that experience I think was really the kind of push off of my, um, my career. Cause I think I, you know, at FISU, I really gained a lot of confidence in myself and a lot of confidence in my stroke. And I obviously saw that backstroke, after making the team in backstroke, you know, I realized backstroke maybe was my stroke. And so I, I focused a little bit more on that. And um, yeah, ultimately, I think I really just gained a lot more confidence in myself and, you know, realized what I could accomplish and realized, you know, maybe I could accomplish more. And um, that mental mental side of, of swimming is really important and can play a huge factor in in, in your success. And I think that really, you know, set me off to um, go into the next year, which was Olympic year and to just, you know, continue to work hard and, and to see what I could achieve because I really had no idea I would be able to win a gold medal at Sisu and, you know, beat out the two Americans that they were slated to, to you know, go one and two. And I remember after the race, I saw, it was Brittany, Brittany McLean had tweeted that I had, you know, just the congratulations. And I had broken a minute for the first time. I was 59.9. And um, I just remember being so, you know, in awe that she knew who I was and she recognized what I had swum at FIFA Games when she was preparing for, um, you know, bigger meets. And, um, yeah, it kind of just put things in perspective. And I was like, oh, you know, like maybe I could, I could, maybe I could do more and to really just put my head down and keep working and have confidence in myself. 
Well, it's funny. I have a couple of questions about that too, because you had a really good trials in 2015. I mean, you also won a bronze medal on the 200 IM, I think, at, that, at those trials. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and I'm curious about this specific thing. I'm glad you brought it up because you you were going in first in the 100 back in the finals, and you end up third. And there's two, I guess, two parts to that. One is how was it dealing? Was there nerves or pressure or just, I mean, the fact of the matter is you swim events that our women, the depth of our women's backstroke as you've come up has been phenomenal, right? Like we've got a lot of phenomenal world-class female backstrokers. So what was the the situation like when you go in first, did you feel the pressure of the moment? Was that a learning experience? And then coming out third and then having to readjust because yeah, the home games in Toronto were probably more kind of a bit home in Ontario, but a bit more of a focus for some swimmers, even more than the world's that year, just because it was a home games. Yeah, for sure. I think all, all of the above, I, I definitely experienced, um, nerves I was scared to even see what I could do as as silly as that sounds I was almost scared of success and scared of you know what what could happen and um I had just never really been in in a in a position like that and I felt um I don't know I just limited myself maybe or um I yeah I, I don't really know <laughs> but um you know the 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 women and obviously I was racing against um, Hillary Caldwell and and Dominique Bouchard I believe and so you know those were girls who had already been on national teams and I was just like scared out of my mind to have you know I was like how did I come first after prelims and it was just crazy to, for me to even think about that but um, again it all just adds to the experience I think and at, once I experienced that and you know placing third and finals like yeah I was a bit disappointed but I um, I ultimately, um, you know, I had the opportunity to, to be on the FISU team. So I was, I was happy still and um, was looking forward to that experience. Well, and the thing is that you also, you didn't swim poorly in that final, right? Like you ended up third, yeah. but it's not, not like you, you were a trainer. You, you swam well in the final. Um, but sometimes going in first, there's an extra pressure. And the reason why I want to bring that up is that because you went to FISUs and obviously swam brilliantly, won the gold medal there. And then it leads into this, this, other season, but the other thing that came out of that, if I'm not mistaken, as well, is the trials and the, or the summer. I think all of that combined to allow you to go. Um, or no, sorry, I'm think I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, I'm mixing my ears <laughs> up. But anyway, it led into the, the 15, 16 season, and and you went into trials, and then it just you went on this run. And the thing that I find fascinating is a lot of swimmers will go through that first time, second time they're on a senior team, or whatever. It's like there's a learning process to adapting to it. But you kind of just jumped in with two feet and and went with it, right? Like breaking Canadian records, winning trials, you go to the Olympic Games, um, you win a bronze medal, uh, tie for a bronze medal, and, and kind of get everything going. And it just never looked like you had a hard time adjusting to that senior A team or going to the Olympics. Like you just, was it just that you're, you're kind of your personality, you can live in the moment or, or just allow yourself to embrace it all when you're there and not let any stress or nerves get you? Like how was that transition of just going into that, that arena for the first time? In, uh, in Rio? It, yeah, like you get going to trials as the favorite or, or one of the yeah. favorites, and then you break the Canadian record, you swim great, and then you go to Rio and swim even better, and, and you get on the podium. Like, yeah, how, how was that that whole experience just happening so quickly for you? Yeah, um, so I would say going into trials, I you know, I obviously had the goal, and I had you know, that's what I was looking forward to do was to make the team, and um, but I hadn't made it before, so I think that that um, mentally is, I don't know the word I'm, I'm looking for, but if you haven't achieved it already, you know, it's just something you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I had already achieved it, you know, I, I may feel more pressure to do it again. So going into 2016 trials, you know, I had, you know, I obviously wanted to make the team and that was my ultimate goal and um, dream since I was a little girl, but I had never done it yet. And I, and it was just like, it was all exciting and um, I was just, yeah, taking in the moment and um, didn't really know what was going on. You know, I, I feel like it was just another meet as scary and as um, nerve wracking as it was. I feel like it was just, I remained somewhat calm and just um, excited. And I think, you know, that's something now I still remind myself. It's just those times in my swimming career where I've been so, just almost inner focused and just 
um, in the moment, being present, enjoying the whole experience. And I think those are the times when you swim your absolute best. And those are the times that I've swum my absolute best is not letting those pressures and expectations and all those external things, um, you know, thoughts in your head, negative thoughts or doubting thoughts, you know, get to you. And um, I, I took that from trials after having made the team and um, going into the Olympics it was the same thing. You know, I had never been to an Olympics and it was a goal to be on the team. And I was just so excited to be amongst such incredible swimmers. And um, I kind of just stuck to my own, you know, did my own thing, did what I needed to do in training and leading up to the meet and um, in warm up and things like that. And um, really just kept the environment calm. And um, I, you know, I remember vividly the night before my hunter back final was Penny's race she had won her medal and it almost just made it like so normal that you know she was so you know we were just listening to music together kind of just keeping our minds busy and then um I was you know I just felt like well if she can do it like it just gave me that like motivation and inspiration and um Byron and I had actually had a bet that if I placed better than him at the Olympics then he would get me concert tickets. So that was kind of our, our running bet. And that's kind of how we kept it light was that he, you know, we just had this bet going that um, I had to place better than he had when he went to the Olympics. And um, yeah, I think just keeping, keeping that environment light really um, helped me and my family was there. So I remember when I walked out for my race, I was, you know, I was like, just look for your family. You're never going to be able to see them because there's a million people in here, but just, you know, look for the Canadian flag and just um, really just soak up the experience because, you know, you, you never know what, what, what can happen. And, um, you know, that is something that I continue to tell myself. And I think that's something you can easily lose sight of. And um, even for kids growing up in, in club swimming, just like cherish those moments that um, and experiences you have, because, you know, you never know if that may be your last one or if, um, yeah, you really just never know. So to just cherish the, the experience and the environment and um, to try and stay calm as best you can. I love that. I've got, I've got two follow-ups on that one now because I need, I need to know what concert you ended up going to. What was the winning concert? <laughs> it was a Drake concert and I went with Penny after the Olympics in 2016. Fantastic. And then my second question, and you just got me thinking, and I was curious when you said you and Penny listen to music and things like that, what kind of ready room person are you? Are you, I'm laughing, I'm smiling, I'm talking, I'm focused and I'm serious, or I'm just in my own mood and I'm dancing, listening to music. Like everyone's different. So I'm just curious, like what's yeah. you, what, what kind of ready room person is Kylie? Yeah. Um, I would say it, uh, you know, it varies a little bit, but, um, I really saw comfort in even in, in 2016 and trials and um, at the Olympics and in 2017, like Hillary Caldwell was always in the ready room with me. And it was so nice to just have, you know, someone who was familiar and she's super chatty. And so we, she was always just chatting and at, whether I was contributing to the conversation or I was just listening. Um, she knew a lot of international swimmers as well. Cause she had been around for a while and, um, you know, I found comfort in just like, oh, everyone's just kind of like, you know, people are doing their own thing, but some people are also chatting. So I do love um, just kind of chatting because I think it, it just calms me down and, and makes me feel like the environment is normal. And this isn't the biggest stage that I've ever been on. But um, at the same time before, well, I listen to music before I go into the ready room, but I find the kind of whole ready room processes um, can be fast paced. And, and, you know, I feel like it feels long, but it also goes really fast. And to get your, your swimsuit on and your cap and goggles and everything checked, it's just like one thing after the other. I feel like I would just lose my earphones or something and be, um, you know, a bit flustered. So I tend not to bring my music actually into the ready room, but I do enjoy listening to music before to, again, just, I think it kind of helps me get those thoughts out of my head that I don't need to listen to and just um, you know, if I blast my music really loud, it's just kind of, you know, I'm consumed by that and, um, it just kind of puts me in a happy state. So. Nice. Um, as, as a music lover, I, I, I love music. That's, that's my <laughs> one thing. We, we were talking as coaches and the one thing I probably couldn't live without is music. So, um, yeah. I, 
I'm really curious. So this is something I always find fascinating. So you went to the Olympics, you, you won a bronze medal in the hundred back. And it's kind of cool because Hillary was there and she won a bronze medal in the tuner back. So you kind of have that, you know, team backstroke, if you will, because you guys both were able to get on the podium. And then that led, and this is where I got my years wrong earlier, but that led to December where you did the short course world championships. And that one's a lot of fun because that's in a brand new facility in your home town. Um, yeah. And I'm just curious for, for an athlete who came along and like had the FISU success and then you break the Canadian record, you go to the Olympics, you win a bronze medal, um, then you're going to short course worlds. How much changed for you with the extra attention or people wanting to talk to you and extra, just all of that stuff, because you come along and you want to compete at the highest level and you go through all that. And that's what an athlete wants to do. But as you're coming along, you're not thinking like, yeah, I really want all that extra attention and I, I want to be everywhere and people want to talk to me. So how, how was that process for you coming out of the Olympics and then going right into another international world championships at home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was challenging. And I, you know, I still find it challenging even a couple of years later. You know, I think that's something you, you continually have to work on is to just not let those external media pressure or expectation, things like that get in the way of what you, you know, what you love and what you, what you want to do and what you want to achieve. But um, yeah, the 2016 short course worlds was, um, you know, obviously really special for me because it was in my hometown and um so many people from all different areas of my life were either volunteering or helping out and, um, you know, doing whatever to make the, to make the games go. And, um, Byron and Linda really thought, we thought a long time about whether I should compete in it or not, because just because of that. And, you know, they asked me to be an ambassador and, you know, thought obviously something I really wanted to do to represent my town, my country, but, um, you know, it also came with a added pressure and an expectation being the ambassador and it being your hometown and, um, then having to swim and, and compete and be at your best. So we thought a long time about that, but ultimately Byron and Linda decided that it was going to be really crucial to have this experience, learn how to deal with it, you know, whether it was, negatively or positively you know whether I performed well or I did really terrible it was going to be a a lesson and um if I wanted to move forward in the sport and continue to achieve bigger and better things and, and if I wanted to get to the top it was something that I I was going to need to learn so um we really looked at it as you know it can go two ways but um it's important for you to have this experience and obviously again it was it was special to me and it was something I wanted to do so um, yeah, that was amazing to, to be a part of and to be an ambassador and representing my, my town. It was definitely bizarre having the whole world here in, in such a small, I feel like, place that no one even knows exists. But, um, you know, once everyone was here and the games went on, it was, it was fantastic. But, yeah, dealing with, with those external pressures and media, things like that, I think just um, – helped teach me what I needed to focus on and where I needed to channel my energy and, um, you know, what I needed to do. Now, did you have people that, that worked with you or helped you with, with that, like just with the extra pressure and people want to talk to you and having to go and make appearances? Like, like, did you have people coach you through, whether it be through Swimming Canada, U of T or Byron Linda, like, like, was there, or is there anybody that was super instrumental in just helping you kind of manage and, and keep it all calm? Um, I would say, you know, Byron and Linda probably the most just because, um, you know, they were obviously behind my swimming and knew, you know, my swimming and were coaching me through that. And, um, you know, with so much experience on their side, coaching other athletes and, you know, having been in the sport for so long, they, um, just giving me little tidbits here and there to, you know, make sure I'm focusing on what I need to focus on, but also, you know, but they also really push for me to, make sure I enjoy being the ambassador and make sure I enjoyed, you know, that I was representing my town because it was, you know, when is it ever going to happen again? That short cross worlds would be in, in Windsor, you know, you never know, <laughs> probably not while I'm still swimming. So um, it goes all over the world and um, to be, for it to be in my town when I'm swimming and, you know, that's, that's crazy coincidence. So to really just take that opportunity and to, um, you know, be grateful for that and be grateful that I had was in the position that I was in to, to be an ambassador and to have had success in Rio. And, um, but yeah, also just 
focus on the swimming and the swimming was what I was there for and um, to not get too carried away with everything else. Did you find it was a little bit sweet having the short course worlds in, in, in December in your hometown after kind of missing out on the Pan Am games that were hosted like in Toronto, it's, it's like at the home games, like, was it almost like, okay, well, this was a nice little, little treat to get afterwards to have it right in my hometown. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, to keep it in Ontario is, is crazy to have that back to back. But um, also I just remembered too that it, it was in December. And so that was exam time for mm. school. For university so that was also another added stress to to the decision and whether I was going to do it or not but um again we we ultimately did it and um you know I have great support through the university and I was allowed to you know move a couple of exams and take them later so it all worked out in the end well it certainly did and and not to diminish it at all like now we're kind of getting to the part that I mean, anyone in the swimming world really knows, right? 2017, you go to the world championships, you you win the 100 backstroke, you break the world record, um, and then it leads to breaking records and winning medals at the Commonwealth Games, the Pan Pacific Championships, coming back. And in 2019, once again, defending your world title, which I think you're the first uh, Canadian swimmer to ever defend a world title, um, which was pretty cool. So you, you broke all of these records, um, broke a world record, we're winning all these levels. Um, and to the outside person, almost making it seemingly look easy, right? Just going and, and, and we know it's not absolutely. Um, but what was that process like when you just kept going on this run and kept swimming well, and, and it was the big moment and you were always ready to go and ab able to perform. And, and I'm just going to add on to that because in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, your world record was broken and I don't know if it was the prelims or the semis, but then you came back and you won the gold medal in the final. Um, just walking through that process of those 17, 18, 19 were some big years and you went through a lot. Was it, was it smooth sailing? Did you have ups and downs? Were there different challenges? Like, like how was that whole ride that you've been on these last few years? Yeah. Um, I mean, it definitely looks from the outside. I think it, it, it looks easy, but, um, I've definitely had my ups and downs and, um, I think every athlete has, and it's important to, to have those downs in order to have the ups. And so I think I though yeah, the last number of years have been a whirlwind and um, have been really exciting. And um, obviously 2017 was, you know, my, I think my, my favorite year having, having broke the world record. And um, I think going into 2017 world, I was, I was still chasing. I had, won a bronze medal at the Olympics, but I was still, um, you know, there were still people faster than me. And I was still kind of, I would say an underdog because um, in Rio, I was definitely an underdog and no one, you know, really knew who I was. That was my first like senior international team. And um, so having won a bronze um, going into 2017, I would still say I wasn't that um, much of a, a focus, but um, after our Canadian trials in 2017, when I was that close to, the, I think I was 0 0.09 off the world record at trials. Mm -hmm. And that was when I kind of realized, you know, what, that it, the world record was even that close. Like, to be honest, before that, that meet, I had, I didn't know what the world record was. And I was really just, you know, I loved backstroke and I loved racing and I loved just like getting up and going and pushing myself to, to see what I could do. And, you know, again, that's something that I, I come back to all the time is just, I feel like I swim my best when I'm just like getting up and going. I'm just, I'm not thinking about anything. I'm not, you know, specifically focused on a, a number. And um, I find that's when I'm doing my best. But um, yeah, so going into 2017, I didn't really know trials. I didn't, I didn't know the world record or anything, you know, swam that race and was kind of like, whoa. And then I had a lot of attention on me going into world championships that summer because it was, I was, I had gone this time at, at our trials. And, um, but at that point I was still chasing, you know, I hadn't accomplished it yet. I hadn't done it. I hadn't won a gold medal yet. So it was still kind of something that was, exciting and I was like pushing myself towards and I wasn't um, bogged down too much on the pressures and expectations they were definitely there and there were things that I was having to really focus on 
not looking at, not looking online, not looking at social media as much, just because it was, I felt like, you know, everywhere I was looking, it was, you know, someone putting out an expectation or someone, you know, saying something. So um, that's where I began to, I think, realize the, that other side of success. And, um, and then, yeah, the race itself, I was, you know, obviously super happy with, and um, that's, still I think my favorite race and those world championships were amazing we won bronze medal in the four by 100 mixed medley relay as well which was really cool for Canada and to just um that was the first year that they had that implemented so racing with um Rich and Yuri and um you know racing against men and with men and women together was really exciting so um yeah that world championships was awesome and then um after that I really again, I had to focus a lot on my mental game and um, just continuing to put my head down and do the work that I needed to do and to not get too caught up in pressures and expectations. And leading into, so 2018 was, Commonwealth, we had Commonwealth Games in March mm-hmm. and then the Pan Pass for that summer. So Commonwealth Games was an interesting timing with just the school and everything and, and training. We we never have that big of an international competition at that time of year. So it was interesting to try and prepare for that. And um, it was outdoors as well, which is a lot challenging for backstroke. So that I focused a lot on. I did a couple of training camps in, in Florida and Phoenix to just get that outdoor work. And I think, you know, Conleys, I really enjoy Australia. It was beautiful. And the games itself were were awesome again but I saw I found myself again really having to focus on um not too much because it was it was Commonwealth Games and there wasn't that much attention towards it but um still just again controlling what I could control and trying to stay in my lane as best as possible Mm -hmm. um and then yeah leading in so 2018 was the summer of 2018 was when Kathleen broke my world record so she broke it at their trials, um, which was when we were already at staging camp in, in Tokyo for Pax that summer. So that was, um, you know, that was different for me to experience. And um, obviously I was super happy for her and had, had raced her for a number of years at, at international competitions and also, you know, at pro meets and things like that when we were a bit younger as well. So, um, you know, I was happy for her and really excited that, just for the backstroke field to continue to progress and for me to, you know, it kind of gave me that extra fire to want to get it back that summer. And um, yeah, I, again, I, I feel like I faced expectations and pressure going into that because that was all the talk um, heading into the pan packs because she had just broken it so recently at their national or at their trials. Mm-hmm. So again, just learning how to how to deal with that and focus on what I needed to focus on and, um, you know, addressing the media with, you know, their questions, but also, you know, continuing to work on, on myself and what I was going to do and just to stay focused on, on the task at hand. And um, yeah, and then Pantax. So yeah, Pantax, I did. I don't know. Yeah. So I had one. I won the hundred back after in that, that summer at Pan Pax. And that was really almost a relief for me. I felt that she, you know, she had obviously broken the world record so close to the game that it was almost, you know, in my head, like, Oh, she was just going to break it again. Or she was, you know, she was obviously going to be at her best at Pan Pax. So that made my nerves even, even greater. And I think, again, just learning how to focus on myself and to just enjoy where I was, enjoy what I had accomplished and um, continue to just put my goals in perspective to um, for the future. And um, yeah, I was really excited to have won that race because it just, um, it was kind of, I mean, I don't think my time was, I think that final was quite slow. Uh, I don't think anyone's times were really that great. And um, I think we were all kind of like, well, I'm not sure this is where you touch the wall. And we were like, oh. Um, but obviously to get a gold medal was was the ultimate goal. And I was extremely excited to have done that. And um, 
Yeah, again, I feel like I'm not really touching on any of like the struggle struggles, but I I think that mental side of it is is something that I've struggled on a little bit and something that I still continue to to work on um all the time. Um but it, yeah, and just like injuries here and there, like there's always little little blips. That thing with my knee happened in 20 leading into Commonwealth Games that fall. So that that year of 2018 was kind of I was managing that the whole that whole year pretty much and then you know I'm still managing that and and working twice a week with a physio to make sure that I'm preventing that you know flare up again and I had little um a little rib rib out for a while in um 20 end of 2017 so yeah I feel like little things here and there but I think those you know those really help you um put things in perspective and and you grow appreciation through those downs for the sport for your training for your ability and that's something I saw with injuries a lot you know when you're restricted from doing something or you know I was wasn't allowed to do kick for a certain amount of time you know all I wanted to do was kick and I was like all I was looking forward to was when I could kick again and so but it's almost like currently you know you don't really realize how much you miss it until it's completely taken away from you. And I feel like going back to the sport, we're all going to have such a greater appreciation for, you know, going to morning practice and showing up at the pool and having to dive into a cold, a cold pool. Um, yeah. So I think those downs are, re- are really important in order to put things in perspective and, and to grow appreciation and um, to continue to, to achieve your dreams. Sorry, that was kind of all over the place. <laughs> no, no, you know, I, I I followed that the whole way. Like it, it puts into perspective what you're going through. And I mean, the way that you described it is almost what it feels like going through it, right? You've got injuries, you've got this, you've got different fields. Like maybe it's a relief to have a win. And like you're in a race where you look up at the board after it's done and you won, but hey, we were all a lot slower than we thought, but you got up and you had to race the race on that day and you you came out on top. I just, I think a lot of those pieces come into play and dealing with little injuries or dealing with pressures or dealing with with things in your own mind. Um, it's funny, you, you brought up something that that clicked with me right away, just a little thing about missing the sport. I had a swimmer in our club ask, what do you think the first practice is going to look like when we get back? I said, you're going to see a lot of massive smiles and you're not going to have to push anyone to get in the water no matter how cold or how early. People are going to be eager to get in. Um, yeah. So I, I did want to ask you kind of, as you've gone through, you've had the success and it's never easy. Um, they always say that it's sometimes it's one thing to kind of be the the person who's chasing, who's trying to win, but it's a lot harder to defend it. Right. And you hear that in, in pro sports all the time. Um, do you feel like over the course of the last three years, you've gotten better at dealing with the stress of defending, you know, your title or defending or winning at, at various meets and staying on top because you've managed to do it and it's not easy. Right. Do you feel like it was just something you're getting better at all the time? Yeah, I think I've definitely gotten better and I've just learned little tricks here and there um, to help me focus on that and um, touching on the chasing and um, defending part. I remember in 2018, Martin will be the high performance director. You know, after Kathleen broke the world's record, he said to me, look, now you're chasing again. And it was just easy as that. You know, I was like, you're right. You know, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really matter. And um, I was back in that position that I love, which was chasing. And um, I think even going into 2019, I, you know, it was a different pressure because it wasn't, you know, there was times that were faster than I had ever gone. Um, like I believe, yeah, I believe there, I wasn't seated going in first, but there was a pressure to, you know, defend my world title and, um, yeah, just <laughs> defend the world title and, and to win, to win. So I feel like there's always different pressures. Like they may come across as different, but it's all about like how you are going to deal with it and how you're going to channel that energy to um, focus on yourself and to just, um, yeah, just see what you can do in, in the water. And um, I like to, I try and not focus too, too much on, what I'm doing in the water because I think over I tend to overthink sometimes and I think that can also really um not help me so it's about 
having the confidence in yourself, having the confidence in your training and what you've done, because when you're at a, a big meet like that, or you're at any meet, you know, when you're standing behind the blocks, you can't change anything that's already happened in the past. All the training you've done, like there, you can't change any of that. So what, what's done is done and you just need to have confidence in that and trust your coaches, trust the process and get up and go. And your I think your body really, you know, knows what it's doing and to just have the confidence in your body and your stroke to just do that same hundred back that you've done a million times before. Well, and it's, you said something there that I hear quite frequently from swimmers. Every person I've talked to so far, since I've started doing these, these recordings has said the words, trust the process. You've done the work, just trust what you did to get here and, and swim your race. And, and I love that. I think that's phenomenal advice, especially for young swimmers, trust the process and trust what you've done. The thing I wanted to ask you is, I know for me, I, I, I'm, I'm dying here without swimming. So this is the longest stretch you've gone since you started swimming without being at a pool. Um, and then it kind of came up at such a, <laughs> such a cruel time in a way, because it was right before trials. Like we were already in our prep. We were starting the taper phase. Like we were, yeah. it was, it was right there. So mm -hmm. uh, how a lot of swimmers, they feel like they're in the grind and they're doing the work and they're going and, and your seasons never really end, right? You're just still going. So you probably, the first week or two might be nice to have a break or, or, or once you wrap your head around everything being postponed, but how does it feel being away from it? How badly do you miss it? Is it give you uh, a greater sense of appreciation when you get back to it? Um, like, how are you feeling with that whole process? Uh, um, I definitely would say that I've had my, um, you know, ups and downs throughout this pandemic. And I think that it's, um, you know, it's really important to, recognize that and to understand you know it's okay to feel that you know to just be negative about the situation it's it's important to recognize that you're having those emotions but um it's also important to kind of turn those around and um look at the positives as well and i've had comfort in knowing you know hearing different stories of swimmers like i had a, a, a teammate that took in 2016 he took the time from April after trials through to September all. And he said 2017 was his, was his best year yet. And that's his fastest swim he's ever swum. So um, I feel like just having, recognizing that this break um, can be beneficial. And, you know, it's maybe exactly what the doctor ordered was just a little physical and mental break in order to reset. I think it's hard to consider it a break right now. You know, I go back and forth with um, in my head because I feel like sometimes I'm not necessarily, you know, I'm more worried than I am, um, you know, content with it. But it's about just taking that worry and, and um, you know, turning it into something positive and um, just focusing on, you know, keeping perspective. And um, like I said at the beginning, just being grateful that I'm home with my family and, you know, that I can still be active to an extent and I can still you know I still have access to a couple of dumbbells that my neighbor lent me and um you know spin bikes from the gym like some people might not even have that so um you know really just being grateful and, and being appreciative for what I have and also yeah exactly what you said definitely having greater appreciation for the sport and um when I go back to swimming I will be so excited and I will be so happy to um you know get back in with my teammates and to be given a, a set and um, you know, having to, to conquer that. And I feel like it's crazy. I mean, for you as well, like our lives revolve around swimming. So everything I do outside of the water is with the thought of, you know, performance in mind and just, you know, we can't just freely take off a week or, you know, go away for the weekend. You know, we have these plans and, and this structure for such a long period of time. So um, it really has been an adjustment, but um, yeah, I'm trying to just, focus on the different opportunities that I've been given in this, in this experience, just um, being with my family and cooking new um, recipes and baking a little bit. And um, yeah, just trying different things. And um, it's also, I think, comforting knowing that the whole world is in the same situation. And um, I know a couple of people like swimmers in other countries that are getting back to swimming now. So that was kind of like, Ah, but, um, you know, I know that when it's right here in Canada, we'll, we'll be getting back to, and, um, it's important. Yeah. Like the, the virus is greater than, than sport and 
it is important to recognize that and to make sure you're following what is, is laid out by the government and, and our provinces to stay safe and protect you know, ourselves and those around us as well. It, it's funny what you said, like the virus is more important than, than what's going on with us individually. And I think what I got out of this is how, how privileged we are that we get to live and work in, in, in competitive sport. Um, right? Like, like it really is a, a fortunate thing. Uh, I, I feel blessed mm-hmm. every day that I get to do what I get to do and work with really amazing young people. Um, I don't want to mm-hmm. keep you too much longer. I love hearing your story. I, I do have, I guess, a couple of questions left. Um, the one is, it's safe to say that um, the virus has just delayed you a year uh, down the line to kind of get ready for 2021. Um, but does it alter things much for you? Like, obviously, you're 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 going to continue on, and you're going to get ready for 2021 now instead of 2020. Um, I don't know how it, I might be putting you on the spot here, so I apologize. But I don't know if you've given thought to like all the way to 2024, or where you are, or were you thinking about kind of wrapping up your career at some point in the next year or two, and then moving into your professional life? Like, like how much does this alter maybe your personal plans of what you had laid out for yourself, or maybe you hadn't really thought that far down the line just yet? Yeah, no, I definitely have looked at it. And I, that's something I probably should have mentioned in, the, in your last question was just looking at it as another year to get better. And I feel like this year went by so fast. Like I feel September to December kind of was slow and it was like calming because it was still 2019. And I was like, okay, like we still have a lot of time. And then all of a sudden it was January 1st and it was already 2020. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then I feel like January just flew by, February flew by and like we were already approaching trials. So um, looking at, this, you know, pandemic and this extra year, extra time to train, extra time to get better and um, to just continue to try and be the best that I possibly can be. Um, that also brings me back to mention something that I focus a lot on is um, when you're talking about expectations and pressures is, you know, something Byron and Linda have told me many times, especially leading to a big event is, you know, you're not, you are going to, your goal is to do your best time. If your best time ends up being a world record, you know, that's what happens. If your best time doesn't end up being a world record, but it's still your best time, that's amazing. It's the fastest you've ever been. So kind of bringing it down to just even saying to media and like saying to other people, you know, I'm just going to get up there and try and go my best time. It's a a lot easier than kind of addressing that, um, addressing a question head on. And so that's something I've, I've learned to help me through those kind of media pressures and, and um, expectation questions. But um, it also helps me, I feel like, in my own head. It's just like, you know what, I'm just going to get up there and try and be the best that I've been before and try and go best time. It, it just kind of brings everything back on a lower level and a, a more, not that I'm like up here, it just like kind of brings me down and just um, helps me focus on you know, again, just enjoying the moment and, and having fun. I'm just going to get up and try and swim the best that I possibly can. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. But going back to your question. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry, I was just going to say that's phenomenal advice. I was like, control what you can control and it simplifies what you're doing, right? You you can't control what other people do or how fast they go. But if you get up and be the best you've ever been, you give yourself a shot and that's all you can control. I just, Mm -hmm. I think that's phenomenal coaching. I love that advice that that they gave you. Sorry, I had to jump in. Yeah. No, that's okay. And also what you said about just staying in your own lane, like, I think it's really easy to get caught up in, in who you're racing with and who you're next to and what they're, you know, that was something I remember at the Olympics, just seeing someone who I was going to be racing against still warming up and I was already in my racing suit and I kind of, you know, freaked out a little bit. And it's like, everyone has their different routines. Like I just needed to be confident in what I was doing and I needed to be confident that you know I was already in my suit and I was ready to go but she was still you know doing her warm-up and and getting ready but that was that's her process you know so um just kind of not getting caught up in other people and other things that are going on but um yeah just controlling what you can control and being confident yourself staying in your own lane all cliche kind of but they are really really um helpful to think about well, they're cliches because they're they're actually true, right? And that's why they're cliches. Yeah. That. And, and it, it it really simplifies everything. It's funny that the higher level you get to, the more you want to simplify things. When, whenever you're mm-hmm. younger, you're coming up, it's like you make it out to be bigger than it really is. And it's just really not. At the end of the day, the last time I checked, yeah. you're still going to get your lane with your block and it's not full contact swimming. So, right, unless you go yeah. into the open water. 
So you're, you're still, exactly. you still got everything that you need. Um, so yeah, so yeah. I guess going back to what I was asking earlier was just like, so what does this change for you in, in your future plans, you know, your career plans or, or, you know, were you thinking about 2024 and was that always in the plans or was it kind of get through 2020 and take it one year at a time? Like it's always different for every athlete. Yeah. Um, so I would say it didn't, you know, I think there's other people that I know who are in greater, um, who are, who are just in different situations in, in terms of deciding what they're going to do. And, um, I was planning on after this summer coming back to U of T because I'm, I haven't finished school yet. So I had, um, four more courses and I was going to try and complete those from September to December. Then I would be done school. And, um, I was planning on continuing swimming for as long as I, you know, I love the sport and as long as I continue to want to do it. So, um, but that was kind of my plan. So, um, right now, because of everything I've switched, I'm taking two courses this summer and then I'll have one course to do in the fall, one course to do in the winter and um, kind of stretch those out so that I could, um, have that balance. I really find that that's valuable for me, um, when I'm swimming to still have something else outside of swimming to focus on. And, um, that just, helps me personally and I find it um you know I think swimming can be it is a really intense sport and it can be a lot if that's all you're thinking about so I find it really helpful to have something else to focus on and and to um exert my energy on so that is or has been it was school for me this year and um you know I kind of just re um what's the word like rejigged my my school schedule in order to be to have that this year and um yeah I, I haven't really thought too far after that I'll be done I guess I'll be done school next year then and um yeah I'll just continue to keep swimming for as long as I'm enjoying it and um I'm looking forward to continuing to try and push myself well and it, it's funny like they say these are the years you get to be a world-class athlete right like th this is the time to do it mm -hmm. Uh, when you're my age, you can say you want to, but, um, you know, I'm trying to think of sports that I can, I can ride a horse maybe, or I can get into curling. These are maybe some <laughs> I can get into, but, um, no, it's, it's, it's a fun time to kind of be at the top of your sport. And, um, if you're somebody who loves traveling, you've gotten to see so much of the world through swimming and, and traveling and all that in different camps. So, um, yeah, I've, my, my unsolicited advice is enjoy the ride as long as you're on it. Cause it, it's good times. Right. Um, Exactly, yeah. I, I have one last question for you and then I'm, I'm going to let you go. And it's just the question I like to ask people is if you had to go back and talk to yourself, this is the question I love. Like say you had to go back at, at one point when you were a young girl or a teenager or, or talk to a young, a young swimmer now, um, and just give them a piece of advice or something that, you know, now at this point in your career that you can go back and talk to somebody at any point, what would that be? If, if there's anything you would, you would advise somebody or advise yourself, if you go back and tell yourself, um, Hmm. I would probably say to, um, you know, definitely growing up in, in the sport is to really just um, enjoy those friendships that you make with your teammates and those connections and um, you know, to not put too much pressure on yourself as a, as a young kid in the sport and um, to just enjoy it and cherish it for what it is. And then also to just have, I think have confidence in yourself and to not doubt yourself to, um, you know, not, not to put limits on yourself. Those are all kind of, I feel like things that everyone says, but um, I think they are true. And I think confidence is so important in, in our sport and in order to compete. So I think, um, you know, learning to have that confidence at a young age is, is great. And to really, to not compare yourself to other people because you never know what you can achieve and you never know what is, um, you know, what is going to happen. So to just, again, have that confidence in yourself and um, yeah, to just have fun with it. Excellent. I think that's fantastic advice. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time you sat here and, and sharing your story and your journey. Um, I, I love doing these. I, I'm really blessed and fortunate to get to sit down with great people like yourself. Um, I know that I, I want to wish you all the best of luck with everything going forward with your career. I, I'm going to be rooting for you. I'm going to be really excited to watch you represent our country again. Um, and yeah, just be safe, stay healthy. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing you on pull deck again in the near future. But, but thank you so much for your time. And thank you for doing this today. I really, really appreciate it.
No, thank you for having me. It's, it's awesome that you have this platform and um, are connecting with, with swimmers on all levels. So thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, you take care of yourself and, and enjoy the rest of your day and, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. You as well. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.